Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me here. It's, a, it's an honor to be here and an honor to give the first talk to uh, kick things off. So, yeah, the first half of my talk is going to be on some results from a year ago on polarization-enhanced cooling of strontium fluoride molecules in a deep optical dipole trap. The second half of the talk, I will discuss some, some newer results since we've gotten to UChicago. Um, but before I do any of that, since I am giving the first talk, I um, figured I'd give a little bit of motivation for why laser cool molecules in the first place, plus a quick uh, review of some of the past decade or so of progress. Uh, so why laser cool molecules? Uh, so ultimately, it, to me at least, it boils down to just in to increasing the chemical diversity of ultra cool molecules beyond one sigma ground state by alkalis, because if all you cared about was just making ultra cool molecules, this is a fairly robust way to do it. Um, however, we want to do more, more than just just by, by alkalis. Uh, other molecules can have other interesting applications. Uh, for example, all cooled molecules that I'm aware of thus far have a spin degree of freedom or two sigma states, uh, and they, those have potential applications in quantum simulation and quantum information. Uh, not, and not just diatomic molecules have been cooled and trapped, but also triatomic molecules and some polyatomics may also be laser coolable. Many of these have applications to precision measurements, and specifically those primarily with heavy nuclei, and we're going to hear talks about at least two, probably three of these uh, molecules uh, later on in the session. Um, there may also be quantum chemistry applications, and people are working on cooling organic molecules, and you'll hear about some of these later on as well. Uh, and there are many more applications that I, I probably didn't even think of to list here, but this is just a quick motivation. Okay, so. How do we laser cool molecules? And I'll give a quick summary of our decade or so of progress in, in that. Uh, so brief review, molecules that are amenable to laser cooling are ideally going to have a few features. They're going to have diagonal Frank Condon factors for at least one excited state to mitigate vibrational branching. Ideally, they can be produced in a cryogenic cell, uh, probably using a helium buffer gas in order to populate low rotational quantum number. If you did it at room temperature, you'd populate many vibrational and rotational states. Uh, other than the states that you're interested in, which are either n equals 1 or 0, typically. Uh, and, and ideally, you'll also want to start with a cold beam. Your molecules should have sufficiently high scattering rates, so, so they can be cooled reasonably quickly and slowed reasonably quickly, and wavelengths for which high laser power can be achieved. Uh, one molecule that, you can, that has all these features is strontium fluoride. It has good fr Frank Condon factors for two different electronic transitions, uh, x to a and x to b. Uh, b the little b here indicating branching ratio from uh, the excited state v equals zero to ground state v equals zero. Uh, it can be produced in, in this sort of cryogenic buffer gas system by ablation in two different ways. And in about a decade ago, uh, laser cooling of strontium fluoride was first demonstrated. So how did that work? So again, we have 98% uh, branching back down to the ground state, state if you excite to a vibrationally uh, an electronic state at v prime equals zero. Pretty good, but you do need to cycle many more than 50 photons. So you do need to have some repumps from these ground vibrational states. Uh, you know, typically one, two, maybe three. Uh, and yeah, uh, another thing I'll point out here is that uh, in order to avoid rotational uh, branching, or in order to have rotational closure for molecular systems, typically we drive transitions from an n equals one state to an n equals zero state. Otherwise, if you drove from n equals one to n equals two, let's say, you can fall to n equals three, and you can fall further, and all of those also have vibrational states, it, it would be a huge mess. So just for rotational closure reasons, we drive n equals one to n equals zero. These molecules also tend to have interesting uh, spin rotation splitting and hyperfine structure, uh, all on the order of tens to hundreds of megahertz splittings. Uh, these can be bridged with, for example, phase modulated uh, sidebands, um, as, as was done in this first laser cooling experiment. Uh, and you can see the results here. Um, so one thing that's interesting about having to drive this sort of rotationally closed transition is that it has you know, a greater ground state angular momentum than excited state angular momentum. And this is what's called a type two transition, which has dark Zeeman states, meaning you don't get the stretch state cycling uh, that you can often use for uh, Zeeman slowers and magneto optical traps. So Without that, how can you actually slow and trap these things? Um, so in kind of, kind of the simplest way to do it would just be, you know, if you don't have a Zeeman slower to uh, kind of compensate for your Doppler shift as you slow your molecules from the cell as they become loaded into MOT, what you can do instead is just spectrally broaden your laser profile, symbolized by this shaded orange here, such that it covers the whole hyperfine structure of your molecule, both at V equals zero, symbolized by the solid lines, and at 
some maximum velocity that you want to slow down from your cell. Uh, and this creates a you know, very broad uh, slowing profile. This is acceleration as a function of velocity uh, along this z-axis here. Uh, but it does work for slowing molecules all the way from your typical cell speeds to your capture speeds around V equals 10 or, or less. Um, so yeah, a downside to this is that because it's such a uh, shallow fall off here, uh, you might slow some of your molecules prematurely. You increase the likelihood of missing the mott entirely by pluming for those molecules that have uh, some transverse velocity. And sometimes you can even turn around your molecules because there's nothing stopping them here. So this slowing process is pretty inefficient, but you can, it can work. Uh, and it was then used to then capture molecules into a mott. So the second question I proposed earlier is, how can you actually trap in these type 2 systems? One thing I, I, I didn't mention there is that not, not only is it a type 2 system, but this upper state has a pretty small uh, magnetic G factor. Um, so there were two possibilities kind of discussed in order to do this. Um, one would be dual frequency trapping, where um, basically you have light of uh, red detuning and blue detuning that are opposite polarizations, such that if you're in this state, you're likely to absorb from the red light. Uh, if you're you know, displaced to the right here. If you're in this state, you're likely to absorb from the blue light of that same, uh, propagating in that same direction. And in this state, you're equally likely. So for two of your three states, you are likely to absorb from a, a, a laser that's going to provide a restoring force. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to use what's called an RF mod, where basically you synchronously uh, switch the, uh, the sign of your magnetic field gradients and also the polarization of your light. And this is symbolized here in a, in a uh, j equals 3 halves to j equals 1 half transition, where over here you're going to want to drive sigma minus light to give you a restoring force. And then over here, once you've pumped into these states, you can then drive sigma plus light and at, with a swapped B field and provide the same sort of restoring force. Uh, so this has been done many, by, by many groups at this point. Uh, one thing I'll point out here is that the MOT temperatures are typically much higher than the Doppler temperatures. Uh, in these systems, and relatedly, the cloud size is a good bit larger than you might expect for atomic MOTs with similar number of molecules, or similar number of atoms. Uh, so why are these so hot, and what do you do about it? Um, so they're so hot primarily because, uh, again, since it's a type 2 transition, uh, the, the same sub, so the subdoppler forces actually wind up giving you heating as opposed to cooling. So it's the opposite kind of, of uh, Sisyphus cooling that's used effectively in atomic systems. Uh, so basically, for any velocity that's below some certain crossover velocity, which kind of depends on your laser excitation parameters, um, you're actually going to experience a, a heating force, and molecules are going to tend to have velocities of, of this order of magnitude, which leads to very, very hot temperatures. So what can you do to stop that? Well, you can turn off your magnetic field, um, and then you can switch all of your lasers from red detuning to blue detuning. That's going to reverse the sign of this force, and you can cool to about 50 microkelvin in about one millisecond. This was first demonstrated by the Tarbert group in 2017. Uh, once you get cold enough to do that, you can, that's cold enough to actually load into magnetic quadrupole traps or into optical dipole traps. And that was the kind of state of the field in 2018, and it was the state of our experiment the last time uh, we were at ITAM, which I think was around 2019 for a cold molecule workshop. Um, so Around that time, we had recently heard, at that time, recently, had heard of a way to get even colder, which was using something called lambda-enhanced gray molasses. So, what, so you can get colder than 50 microkelvin by, if, you're, if you're able to reduce the amount of photon scatter you have, because that's your main heating source remaining. Um, you can do that by creating this robust dark state in uh, what's called a lambda configuration, where basically if you have zero Raman detuning, um, and, then you'll have a dark state that's comprised just of uh, superposition of these two states, uh, which doesn't couple to the Hamiltonian if you have no Doppler shift and if your Raman detuning is zero. Molecules, so, so in other words, once you reach V equals zero, you get stuck in this state and your scattering turns off. Uh, and this was used in calcium fluoride, coupling these two states in particular um, to load an optical dipole trap of calcium fluoride. Uh, and the temperature does get a little bit hotter in the optical dipole trap, and I'll point out why that is later on, but um, for, they were able to load an optical dipole trap in this way. Um, so naturally, we tried to do the same thing. Why not? Um, so what happened when we did it? So we coupled uh, those same states, F equals 2, J equals 3 halves, and F equals 1, J equals 1 half. Uh, we cooled them up 50 microkelvin uh, using this, the standard four laser molasses uh, that had been used previously, and then we applied lambda cooling in that same way. And what did we find? We found that the temperatures actually got hotter. And the longer I applied lambda cooling, the hotter they got. Um, so why? What? Um, 
So this motivated me to develop a quantum trajectory simulation that I won't get into the details of, but what I'll point out is that the trajectory mat the, the simulation matches the results. Uh, basically, if you do cal if you land with cooling on calcium with these states, it works. If you do it with strontium cooling, it, strontium fluoride, it doesn't. It's not cooling. Um, so that's unfortunate. The kind of takeaway here is that sometimes your molecular details actually do matter. Luckily, we were able to find a configuration that did work, coupling the two f equals one states with the different uh, j angular momentum. Um, so just use a different pair. This this is from simulations, but the experiment works just as well, and we reached 10 microkelvin. Uh, so now we have figured out a way to actually do lambda cooling to the 10 microkelvin level. We decided, okay, now let's try floating out the dipole trap. Our starting point for this is a MOT with about 3,500 molecules and the uh, you know millikelvin temperature, millimeter size. Uh, we were loaded an optical dipole trap by overlapping our ODT beam with our lambda cooling beams, which come from the same beam as our, as our MOT, basically. Um, uh, so once we've loaded the ODT, we can turn the lambda cooling off uh, to get rid of the untrapped molecules and then turn it back on to image, and we can get these images of the optical dipole trap. And I'll point out that our imaging system is at a 45 degree angle with respect to the optical dipole trap, so we can actually image at 45 degrees with respect to the weak axis. The size of the profile along that weak axis is going to be related to the temperature of your cloud. Okay, so next we decided to try to use optical dipole trap polarization to minimize temperature. So I pointed out earlier that uh, the temperatures that are achieved in the optical dipole trap are a little bit hotter than can be achieved in free space. And the reason attributed to this was that there are differential shifts that occur between the different Zeeman sublevels that are, that are coupled by your lambda cooling light. Um, and this is because uh, two sigma states have both tensor and vector polarizability. And here I show what, those ten uh, what that means in terms of the trap depth of the different uh, sublevels of these f equals one states. Um, yeah, so basically there, there are three sublevels, they have three, they have different energies, and what we figured was that, okay, you may not be able to get all three to be uh, degenerate, uh, plus or minus the, 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 uh, the, 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 the hyperfine frequency between them, but what you can do is at least get some pair of them degenerate with each other, right? That's what, so if we can get some pair, at least we'll have some sort of dark state. And there are a few ellipticities where this is actually the case. Um, where, and we figured, okay, that's gonna make a coherent dark state both inside and outside of the trap, and we should get better cooling. And here I'll point out that uh, gamma here is just symbolizing the uh, ellipticity of the beam, and the sign of, of gamma indicates the circularity of the beam, or sorry, the, the, polariz the polarization. Uh, and this is reasonable because we expect Zeeman shifts, uh, we, we, it's been seen previously that Zeeman shifts of about the same order of magnitude have led to worse cooling as well, and for, for the same principle. Okay. So we verified that our stark shift calculations were, were reasonably accurate by using microwave depletion. Basically, we were able to see that there are these depletion features. One kind of moves towards higher frequency, uh, which we see here, and another one that always occurs in the same spot, no matter what our polarization is, we see that here. So that gave us some confidence we were actually calculating these things correctly. Um, so what did we find? We, well, we found that the temperature does, in fact, depend on the polarization but just not how we expected. What we actually found was that it simply depends on the, well, the sign of gamma ODT and just how circular you are. So previously we expected that the same magnitude of uh, ellipticity um, would give the same results, but here clearly we see that plus and minus 45, very different, plus and minus 15, also pretty different. Further, we saw that this dependence reversed when we reversed the, so the sign of the polarization of the lambda cooling light. Uh, so now minus 45 degrees is good and plus 45 is bad. Um, so the, as I said, the differential shifts don't depend on the sign of gamma ODT. So what causes this? Uh, so what appears to cause this, as far as we can tell, is a intensity imbalance be between the lambda cooling light. Uh, so basically our, our beam, we actually counter circulate it uh, so a single beam provides cooling along all six axes. It gets retroflected here and then bounces back. Uh, and depending on where you put this adjustable expander, the uh, ratio of intensity from your incident beam and your, your final pass of your lambda cooling beam can have quite different intensities. Uh, you can adjust the balance by uh, reduce, changing this adjustable expander. Uh, and if you do, you find that this, this dependence uh, is, is mitigated and it, there's no longer any dependence on, on, on this effect. Um, and it happens to be when the OAT polarization of the ODT matches this weaker uh, co-propagating light. 
Um, so we said, okay, so we see that this is happening. We varied the actual intensity and balance, figured out what the minimum, what temperature we could achieve with our optimum polarization for whatever that ratio was. And we find that the temperature is minimized for a ratio of about 0.75. As for why this is, we're not totally sure. Um, we believe that it, it could be possible that the lambda imbalance is com somehow compensating for these ODT differential star shifts. Um, but we were un un unfortunately unable to replicate this behavior in our optical block equation solver. Um, but we were able to further optimize temperature by changing these two, uh, these Raman detuning parameters and also the ratio of, of uh, intensity in each of these hyperfine states, addressing each of these hyperfine states. And eventually we were able to reach temperatures of 14 microkelvin in a fairly deep tap trap. Now without this intensity imbalance induced polarization enhancement, it's a mouthful, uh, the trap temperature was about 50 microkelvin and that's similar to what I've seen in other experiments with similarly deep traps. Um, so what does this give us? So, you know, this, this, the fact that we can lower our temperature in this way gives us a factor of seven gain in density and 50 in phase space density. And ultimately, we were able to reach densities about 10 to the nine inverse centimeter cubed and phase space density is about 10 to the minus seven, despite only having 150 molecules in our ODT. Um, and we found an ODT lifetime uh, of about uh, one, one second. Uh, and yeah, um, so we expect that the Universal collisional loss, loss rate is about 10 to the minus 10 centimeters cubed per second. So if our optical dipole trap were, had about five times more numbers, or if our lifetime were five times greater, we should start to actually start to see the effects of these collisional losses. The easiest path to do that, I figured, was just to increase the amount of molecules in our many optical trap as we start with a pretty paltry amount compared to some other groups. So we figured there's some gains to be had there. Um, so what do we do next? Well, we went in search of more molecules. So. <laughs> Uh, like like the pioneers of yore, we had decided to head uh, west, moving from Yale to U Chicago. Well, Midwest anyway. Um, so we've you know we've repopulated the lab, uh, <laughs> filled it up pretty pretty quickly. <laughs> but now this is our nice new lab, and hopefully there will be uh, more molecules there to be had. Um, but okay, so seriously, what what are we actually going to do to try to improve many optical trapping? So this is the second half of the talk uh, from some simulations that I, I had done, and it was published on the archive or not put on the archive a couple days ago. Um, and I'll talk about three of these new techniques uh, in, in whatever time I have left. Okay, so one, the first of these techniques uh, is what I call the two color mot. Um, so I mentioned earlier that strontium fluoride is not just one, but two states that have good Frank Condon factors. Uh, one of these is the A state, which we've been talking about so far. The other one is the uh, B state. Um, so there are some differences between the states. The A state has unresolved hyperfine structure and basically no upper state uh, magnetic G number. Uh, the upper state has some resolved hyperfine structure and a non-zero uh, magnetic moment. So why would you drive both of these? Well, you can get a higher maximum force. Uh, if in a, in a uh, fully saturated system, the ratio of force is just gonna be the number of excited states you can populate over, divided by, this is say N sub G plus N sub E, apologies, divided by the total number of states in the system. Um, and there may be some potential benefits from having a non-zero excited state uh, G factor. Uh, so I chose to run some simulations where I coupled the F equals two and F equals zero states to this B state. And why did I pick those? Well, neither of them couple to F prime equals zero and that avoids the complication presented by the uh, resolved but somewhat small hyperfine structure up here. Basically, if you go slightly red detuned of this state, you are slightly blue detuned of this state, which can be a problem. So to avoid that problem, I just didn't couple these two. I, those two I picked to go to the A state. Uh, so what did I find? Well, in those simulations, I was able to find that you can, in fact, get stronger forces with these uh, two color systems. Um, and this, this is talked about more in detail in the paper, but the optimized two color DC mod can take advantage of this, of, of the dual frequency uh, mechanism that I talked about earlier, except now it's being addressed by two different colors as well. Um, switching from one color to do two colors increases the capture velocity we estimate by uh, about a factor of one and a half or so in both DC and in RF configurations. Uh, and that's just due to the stronger damping forces and confining forces. Um, we also see that as we lower the power in our simulation, this idea of mock compression still works. Uh, as we lo lower the power, both the uh, the size and the uh, temperature of the cloud go down and we can reach the similar values of one millimeter and one, one millikelvin. Uh, the limiting factor is still subdoppler heating, which still exists even for, for these two color systems. I mean, there's no reason why I wouldn't. You know, like five minutes? That's fine. Um, yeah. So the next, way, next thing to do would be 
to take a chance, try to see if we can figure out a way to, you know, if, if there's subdoppler heating in a MOT, then that implies that you should be able to find subdoppler cooling in a MOT. And this has been demonstrated in atoms uh, by, by the Tarbot group, but not uh, as far as I'm aware yet in molecules. Um, so we were able to use the our autological heat installer to find a blue detuned two color approach that traps and cools. Uh, so basically the same, same states are being addressed by the same color of light, except now they're blue detuned instead of red detuned primarily. Um, uh, and we're able to see that this cooling force is robust even at fairly high fields, all the way up to 10, 10 gauss and, and maybe even higher. And that corresponds to Z equals uh, four mil, uh, millimeter displacement in, in our simulation. We can also see the effect of the restoring force both here, averaged over the velocity distribution and uh, here, just uh, we can also see that as we change z, the whole curve shifts uh, down as well, also indicating that there's the restoring force. Um, okay, uh, so this high field, the fact that it works at high field, that happens to only be true for a type two subdoppler mechanism. That's been seen in previous simulations by the Tarbot group as well, so that's consistent. Um, and if we just uh, apply this directly to our system, we would expect to find temperatures of on the order of 25 microkelvin and because the temperature is so much lower and the spatial confinement is basically the same sort of magnitude as before, we expect that the cloud size would shrink fairly dramatically, leading to uh, by about a factor of 10, leading to a factor of uh, 10 to the 3 gain in density. And if we're much more dense, we should be able to load m many more of our molecules into the optical dipole trap. Okay, so finally, we'll talk about some improvements to the uh, laser slowing. So I mentioned earlier that there's this very, if you apply the white light slower, we find in our uh, simulations that you get a very broad tail in your, uh, in, in your deceleration uh, profile, um, which can lead to, so the fact that this is a long tail plus you have a fairly low capture velocity in your MOTS means you're very likely to wind up both over slowing and increasing the amount of pluming. Uh, so basically the point here is that, you know, once you get to your capture velocity of say 10 meters per second, there's nothing stopping you from going to five to zero to negative five, et cetera. Um, so it would be ideal if somehow you could cut this off, so you can stop slowing once you're uh, once you're uh, once you've decelerated to the point of the capture velocity. Uh, and for me, the simplest way to do that would be to just add a mirror uh, window from the back here and shine in what I'll call a, a push beam. And basically, unlike the slowing beam, which is very broad and talks to this whole uh, the whole velocity distribution, the push beam uh, is is more near near resonance. And what you can do there is you can create this kind of bump in your uh, deceleration profile and induce this zero crossing. You can induce this kind of hard cutoff that I was referring to. Um, and you can kind of tune where that crossing is and the, the strength of the bump by just changing the intensity of your push beam and also the detuning of your push beam. Um, so you can adjust this zero crossing and you'll wind up piling up your molecules at this crossing velocity. Um, yeah, so slowing improvement number two. Uh, there's, you know, people have thought about this for a while now, but I, I decided to think about it again as well, which is to add a transverse cooling stage. Um, so, you know, if you just simply apply, you know, okay, you, you can figure out how long the molecule takes to get here. You can, fit, you can figure out, uh, you know, it, based on the size of how your MOT capture volume, okay, you can calculate that if you're below, if you have a transverse velocity uh, above, half a meter per second, you're just gonna miss the mod entirely. You're gonna collide here, or you're just gonna miss the mod beams in general. Um, typical transfer spread out of this cell is about 25 meters per second. So basically most of your molecules are gonna be missed. Um, uh, and it's been demonstrated though that you can actually do apply these subdoppler forces for transverse cooling all the way out to six meters per second. And this was done in YBF by the uh, Tarbot group. However, at the, they, they did not apply simultaneous longitudinal slowing. And I just wanted to see if we can apply longitudinal slowing simultaneously with transverse cooling. And surprisingly, I didn't think it would work. I thought that because subdoppler cooling uses dark states and longitudinal laser light can couple you out of those states that it, it wouldn't work. But at least the simulations indicate that in fact it does work. And moreover that if you, ex it works at a bunch of at different slowing intensities, you know, if, as you increase your slowing intensity from this, uh, pretty low value here, this is the saturation parameter to this higher value, you actually enhances your, your cooling, at least in some configurations. So in principle, this should, this should work. Um, so what do you get if you do all of this? So switching from the one color to two color mod, I estimate you get a gain of about a factor of two, maybe a little bit more in, in your menu optical trapping number. If you add the push beam as well as the two color mod, you get a, that's an additional gain of 10 or so, giving you 20, and transverse cooling gives you another additional gain of 10 to 15 or so, 
in you, theoretically at least you should be able to get a pretty pretty large gain in your in your number of molecules by implementing this blue mot that has sub doppler cooling uh, you should get an additional gain in your mot density independent of your number uh, i believe that this will change our odt loading fraction from about 5% which is what it is for a 1 millimeter size cloud to nearly unity which i believe it would be for a 100 micron size cloud and if you add all this up you'd get a potential odt number gain of about you know 6000 pretty pretty high um, so our next steps would be to actually implement some or all of these improvements in our apparatus. You know, we only needed a factor of 10 to start seeing collisions. This would clearly get us there. Um, and with an ultimate goal of reaching degeneracy by evaporative cooling simultaneously with microwave shielding, which has been recently demonstrated in the bioalkali NAK. And we believe that if we were able to increase our density, we'd be able to do something similar for strontium fluoride. Um, so this, this is the end of the talk. I'd like to thank my P, the PI of this experiment, Dave DeMille, and our graduate students as well, and our funding sources. And yeah. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're open for questions. Uh, yes, Stefan. Hey, Donald, thanks for the talk. It's very interesting. Could you explain a bit more why the standard lambda cooling doesn't work? Um, I, I wish I knew why. I mean, <laughs> I know I, I can see that it doesn't. As for why, so I I, I reran this with uh, optical block equation simulations where I you know switched the strontium fluoride um, hyperfine structure to match that, or actually I switched the calcium fluoride structure to match that of strontium fluoride. That then, and then it still worked. And then I said, okay, fine, I'll use the calcium fluoride hyperfine structure, but then have the J mixing of strontium fluoride. Uh, this is mixing between states of the same F but different J. That that still worked. It's somehow this this pathological combination of both the J mixing of strontium fluoride and the hyperfine structure of strontium fluoride that somehow induces this to be the for, the forces to be very low for lambda cooling. There, uh, I don't have a more in you know in depth explanation than that, um, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yes, in the back. Yeah. And higher velocities, there seems to be like fluctuations in the force. Is that real? And yeah, this is real, and this is a result of the hyperfine structure of uh, strontium fluoride. So basically, th at, at, at zero velocity, um, you, we, have, we have four sidebands on our push beam that are resonant with all four of the hyperfine states of strontium fluoride. As the Doppler shifts uh, change, as, you, as, the, as the beam becomes faster here, uh, some of those hyperfine states will then become re resonant. And you'll have you know one or two of those hyperfine states, act, you know, being able to be recycled. So these bumps are real. Um, I don't think they should affect things all that much, especially because you can just kind of turn this on halfway through your slowing. Um, but but yeah, they are real, and they show up where I expect them to. Actually, I have a follow-up question. So why is there only one zero crossing at the velocity, since there are four sidebands and they could all off resonantly couple of the different states? Yeah, so the, I mean, so the, the bump is going to be strongest when they're all resonant at the same time. These bumps just show up when only one of them is resonant. So, you know, if you, um, if I'm one, yeah, okay. So, yeah, basically for the push beam, I have four sidebands that are resonant with all of these. As you change the velocity, you know, they'll become, re one will become re-resonant here, but the other ones won't be. So the bumps aren't going to be as strong. Moreover, um, the bump here occurs when the slowing spectrum is, is a little bit weaker as well. So the bump here is strong enough to actually induce the zero crossing, whereas the slowing, there's a lot more slowing intensity at, at these, of course, one of these velocities, such as the bumps aren't, aren't strong enough to so actually. Basically, zero crossing happening at different velocities. Yeah, well, they don't quite cross zero, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, am I concerned? Oh, well, well, no, I mean, no, so uh, again, another reason to pick these two ground states is that you don't have to really worry about the power boron because F equals two and F equals zero can't couple to F prime equals zero. So you, you avoid the problem. Well, yeah, but, but, but F equals two and F equals zero don't couple to F prime equals zero. So the repulsive force uh, doesn't, doesn't matter in this case. Yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering, is there something uh, interesting going on here by having to use the 
No, so I, I, so at least in the simulations, I use approximately the same total laser power. It's just a matter of, you know, if basically a lot of these molecular mots, you're, you're kind of as close to the saturation regime as possible. They, they tend to be very power hungry. Um, so it's, it's really just a matter of increasing this, I, I believe at least, it's just a matter of increasing this ratio. Um, so if you add more excited states to your system, you can just scatter more light in the first place and you can get more, uh, more forces in, in, the, in that manner. 